Mark Johnson. It gives me great pleasure to introduce him. Mark qualified in 1983, and by his own admission, he always challenged thinking, his own and others, and has sought practice to overcome the repetitive problems he witnessed in the industry. Over the years, he has adopted what he terms as some diverse methods in his quest to find <laughs> solutions that work. Furthermore, he says, observing the unshod horse he was responsible for, he believed their feet looked healthier. He has extended his knowledge of barefoot maintenance based on information gained from both the UK and abroad and from some of the best barefoot practitioners so that his passion for functional anatomy and the whole horse has flourished. Mark delivers anatomy clinics in the UK and abroad and has run a business consistent of unshod horses supported by hoof boots and their use of composite shoes where necessary. Two years ago, Mark took the decision to eliminate steel shoes from his business. Enthusiastic about further educational opportunities, Mark welcomes a collaboration between Robbie Richardson, RSS, and himself as they seek to compile a shoeless syllabus aimed at assisting the farrier in industry. So, Mark, delighted to hand over to you, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. And folks joining, honestly, don't be frustrated with these guys. I've been behind the scenes watching the efforts to get this going. They really have had some issues to deal with. And uh, so top marks to the team for, for getting this moving. Um, I want to start off with some thank yous, if I may. And firstly, obviously, a thank you to the BHS for having put this on and um, getting people talking about feet, which I think is it's a superb initiative. And the other couple of initiatives I want to thank the BHS for. I've had personal experience of the welfare department when it comes to dealing with problem cases, at genuine welfare cases. And I believe the BHS set the gold standard for this. And lastly, I am absolutely in awe of your um, bereavement support uh, system that you've you've implemented. I think that is a tremendous initiative. So again, thank you for that and thank you for allowing me to be here. So, oh, hello. <laughs> Have we changed slides? G Gabby, at this point, it looks as though it's Sarah's presentation yeah. that's now come up. <laughs> Molly, are you able to reshare for Mark's? There we go. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this is about this first slide is about proving, well, hopefully proving that I am a farrier. But the interesting thing is that when it comes to keeping feet in great shape, every hoof care provider on the planet, I'm sure, has got that at the core of their philosophy. So we, you know, we all want to have feet in great shape. But what fascinates me the most is how we we have these these different approaches to and, and different journeys that we go on in, in terms of, uh, of what we're going to do to feet. And for me, uh, you can see bottom left there, aged about 15 years old. That was the very first horseshoe that I ever made under the guidance of David Gully, who went on to train me to become a farrier. And that was made at Leicester County Show. And I still have the shoe today. Now, on the right hand side is the very last metal shoe that I've applied to a horse's foot. And yes, about two years ago, give or take. But it was poignant that I actually photographed that foot because I knew at that stage that, that this was going to be my very last metal application. And, and so I just wanted to capture it. So I'm, I'm going to give you a very, very potted version of my career path, um, because at the end of the day, this is the way that I'm going about trying to, to keep feet in great shape. And, and obviously, like I say, everybody's got their own uh, take on this. Now, as you can see down the middle, I'm all about barefoot, and that's the reason my phone rings predominantly. Um, and it's just been a, a fascinating journey. Hoof boots I use extensively, and we're going to go into that in, in due course. And then finally, when it comes to 
for various circumstances, whatever, if we can't get that horse comfortable in any other way, then I'm going to apply a composite shoe. But my my game is not to shoe if I can possibly manage it. I want to try and get that horse healthy and optimised to be able to perform without. Please, may I have the next slide? Thank you. Right. So what was the what was the driving force behind this decision to change? Well, first and foremost, like all farriers, we all had horses and have horses which are unshod. And for me, it was very much a case of, well, do you know what? Collectively, in general, the unshod feet just looked healthier than the shod feet. It was as simple as that. Nothing more technical. And I thought, OK, well, what can we do about maybe getting a few more feet to look even more healthy? So I was actively taking shoes off of ages before barefoot became any kind of a movement and sort of bumbling around doing my best and not not having half the information that I've got at my disposal now. But in conjunction with that, along the lines, I got introduced to dissecting horses, feet, legs, etc. And that's become all captivating. It's been the the major driving force behind so many of the decisions and protocols that I've adopted. When you drill down into the anatomy, you find out that every day when, we, when we're coming into contact with feet, they're these big, bulky, robust things, and they have a tendency when they make contact with us to really make us feel that they're robust. But diving into the actual anatomy itself and looking closely, the structures are so delicate the way that they're interlinked with, within the hoof capsule and then transmitting on up through the entire horse's body, that interconnection, everything connecting to everything. At that point, you really start to look at this and think, well, how on earth does... Oops, sorry, beg your pardon. At that point, you start to think, how on earth does a piece of metal actually correspond to the whole of the anatomy running through the, the horse? And I've got to this place where personally, I believe it doesn't. But let me put that into context, because for many, many hundreds of years, it's been the best thing we've had at our disposal. And so on that basis, they've stopped, they've stopped an awful lot of horses limping and gimping. They've improved the quality of horses' lives and in good hands, they can still do an awful lot of good. So it's my decision to, to say, no, that doesn't work for me. But we've always got to keep an open mind. And, and this is why I think the BHS's initiative to spark the conversation is so good. Please may I have the next slide. So my, my first choice, is barefoot as I've as I've uh, pointed out. Now, being as old as I am, it was fantastic and to to be kind of right at the start of this. And the way the doors opened for me was that obviously I was still doing what I was doing. I was doing the anatomy stuff, and some of the people who were beginning the barefoot movement in the UK made contact, and that just opened doors for me like there was no tomorrow. What I found from these people were they, they never came from hoof care at all, but they were intelligent problem solvers. And the lengths that they were prepared to go to in, in terms of being able to affect a positive change for their horses was amazing. They took themselves abroad to learn stuff. They were forever researching. And I piggybacked on the back of that so, so much. And I, I'm internally grateful for the start in that because the, the thing is that these folk they had problems with their horses, but farriery couldn't give them the solution in their in, in their area. That's not to say a farrier couldn't have given them the solution. What they had access to wasn't beneficial to, to what they were trying to create. So, so to see the start of this and now see how fast this ball is rolling, see the diversity of information and the extent of information that's pouring into horse keeping, it's an exciting time to be in hoof care. Please may I have the next slide? Thank you. Right. So moving towards hoof boots, because clearly in our world, in the UK and, and further afield, not every single horse is going to be comfortable being barefoot. But with the amount of boot innovation that's going on, part of my job is is to have a knowledge of hoof boots, but I can't be an expert. So I rely very, very heavily on I, mean, I, I carry, let's say, four fit kits. I've, I've 
got the glove fit kit, I've got the scoop boot fit kit, Epine Fusion fit kit and Flex fit kit. And that's all crammed into the edges of the van. And uh, that's what I, I run around with. But but that's nowhere near the extent. So if I get to a horse where I'm not confident, I've got some great resources and it's about networking and building this team around you. And what I can do in those cases where I'm not confident is help the owner to gain the information and the accurate information. So we want really clear photos. We want clear measurements, good lighting to send off. Um, quick shout out, if I may, to urbanhorse.com. And there's uh, Carolina at Urban Horse over the years has suffered my inquiries about boots until... Uh, till the cows come home bless her for it and also there's the hoof boutique as well which offers a, a very very similar service and i'm sure there are plenty of other providers as well but but um urban horse has always tended to be my my crutch to lean on when i'm i'm trying to uh, get the the more the, the more diverse feet booted or, or coped with so but again, it's it's about building that network. Where can you go to for the information? And don't be embarrassed or ashamed to ask for help. So anyway, may we have the next slide, please? So in this example here, this this has been a, a phenomenal situation. You uh, uh, in the front there, we've got the equine fusion jogging shoes on there, and at the back. We've got scoop boots on behind, so there's no problem with mixing and matching. There's no problem in looking for boots that are going to actually tailor for the horse in that particular moment. Obviously, the fit's very crucial and very important. And you can see from the, the boots on the front feet there, the fusions, they've been worked to death. They've absolutely been worked to death. These these boots were on 24-7 in fetlock deep mud for a very, very long time until this horse moved environments and, and they've just allowed it to really flourish and build, etc. So that's it's exciting is what it is, because we've got so much boot innovation going on. May I have the next slide, please? Now. Good friend Robbie Richardson, who is also a farrier, um, we're doing a he's, he's right down in Devon, so he couldn't be further away from me. So the collaborative issue is, is a challenge, but we do collaborate and we are collaborating. We believe that it's time that we really, really pushed this sphere of hoof boots. How far can we take this? And what is the driving force behind it? Uh, in this particular illustration, this horse had a severe injury to its deep digital flexor tendon. And so we needed to elevate because it couldn't physically put its heels on the ground. So it needed a prop. Now, classically, in our farrier environment, we'd be looking at an extremely heavy, bulky shoeing package in order to, to prop that up with a lot of weight on it. We feel that with the with the support and the cushioning that the boot allows, it's very, very easy just to whip that boot off, do a quick trim, quick hoof maintenance, put the boot up, back on. Minimal intervention for the horse and it, it maximises that healing process. And so far, um, adopting this kind of methodology, the, the healing results are, are pretty flipping good. I mean, obviously, we haven't got a study going yet, but just just the, the sheer flexibility of being able to use a hoof boot. So how many of these remedial applications can we replace with a hoof boot? And Farrier's DNA is absolutely engineered towards adaptation of hoof boots. We've got we're a hands on breed, you know, and we've got the feet in, in our hearts as well. So if we if we can take those that skill set, think outside of the box, what can we actually achieve with this? It's it's really, really exciting. May I have the next slide, please? So my introduction to, to the barefoot, I hate using the term barefoot movement, but how else are we going to describe it at the moment? The whole horse health banner is so, so important. If we think about a foal being born, in order to get sufficient development of that hoof capsule we need our foals to be stimulated and moving and going over different terrain and really asking that tissue to develop and build and pump up so movement you can see there is is the the top of the of the tree there but the next thing we've got there is obviously diet now i always put movement at the top because i always feel that movement is paramount but diet is so so close we've got to have um 
appropriate species diet in order to achieve this this development etc and and the and i'm i'm thrilled to bits now to see these track liveries that are springing up all over the place they are they are gradually gradually gaining momentum because unfortunately i the way i feel about this is that we've got a lot of accommodation for horses in this country but we've got very little that actually accommodates and there's a very big difference between the two words and and the more freedom of movement that we can give horses there's always going to be an exception there's always going to be those horses that do prefer to be in the stable but overall as a species we need to have them out and moving and and un, ideally in a controlled nutritional environment so like i say the track systems just float my boat and the amount of innovation that comes in with them as well i just think is is brilliant may i have the next slide please so diet as i said now am i a nutritionist no i'm not am i going to give clients feed plans well no i'm not either although Perhaps I do now and again, but don't tell any nutritionists, please, because that's not my remit. My remit, I believe, is to know when I have a metabolic issue with a horse going on. I need to be able to read the symptoms, whether they're good or bad. And in that case, I'm acting like a GP. I then want the specialist to come in. And what you see on the screen here is just a, just a typical grouping of, of places where I'm likely to send the client to engage. So go and have a conversation about your horse and talk to these these individual people about your horse tell them what's going on and let them guide you because i don't want to take the mantle of nutrition but i do accept that it's a massive one and i need to have background knowledge in it and don't be afraid if something's not working for your horse then try another avenue give it time but be prepared to try another avenue the amount of horses i come across that i'm seeing a symptom in the feet and then we, we talk about the diet and I, I said, OK, well, how long has it been on that? Oh, a couple of years now. Right. A couple of years. And this is what you've got. Let's have a rethink. Let's have a reevaluation. So, yes, in my world, diet is extremely important. May I have the next slide, please? Uh, part of tonight was <laughs> which is the best shoe? How can you get the most out of a set of shoes? Well, guess what? I'm a composite person if I've got to shoe a horse. These composite shoes will physically outlast steel by several times over. Why is that the case? Well, the composite shoe, although it has got a metal insert, that it, this is a Duplo, by the way, as you can see from the from the screen. But that metal insert is profiling the pedal bone itself, so the more rigid part of the hoof capsule. Behind that plate, it's all flexible, mirroring what the very back of the foot does. We hear an awful lot about expansion and contraction when we're talking about hoof and hoof performance and, and um, biomechanics. But actually, nobody is talking or very few of us are talking about compression and release. So ideally, the hoof will come in with a posterior third landing, load and then break over. In that moment, the upward force is actually having a direct effect on the palmar digital vein. It acts like a physical pump. So allowing the back of the foot to flex up and down, I believe personally, is a very crucial part of this. So for me, that's the best shoe. Now, I know a lot of farriers don't like these, but I kind of wonder because my because I'm so entrenched in barefoot, the way that I tend to approach feet to trim, balance and, and go on like that, it's always from a barefoot perspective. So I can at least brag that when if, if one of my horses loses a shoe, it's not going to go instantly foot sore because we're always building that material. We're, we're always trying to nurture the base of the foot. I don't get my knife in and start frog carving and sculpting and ripping sole out and taking bars out. There's too much of that going on at the moment with farriery, And we see that uh, extensively in social media. You are going to make horses sore. You're going to disable them by doing that. Let them build, let them nurture, in my opinion. Anyway, before um, before any farrier throws his hammer at the screen for me saying that, I'm going to hand you back and hopefully Sarah's with us. That That's brilliant. Th th thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, thank you. Sarah was born in Glasgow and was horse obsessed from her young age. Sounds quite familiar for a lot of us. She decided at 14 that she wanted to be a blacksmith, having watched the local blacksmith at the riding school. 
In 2015, after many years of hard work, Sarah achieved her fellowship. Well done, Sarah. Sarah holds the Master Farrier Certificate. She's a worshipful company of farriers judge, as well as being an examiner also. Sarah loves competing and has represented Scotland as both apprentice and senior, and has competed at the European Championships on five occasions. Sarah has a mixed round of work which she loves shoeing everything from our lovely Scottish Clydesdales to show ponies and stud farm work. Sarah employs one apprentice currently and they still make 90% of their shoes. Sarah has a vested interest in keeping horses barefoot where possible. So Sarah, really nice to meet you. Glad, glad that you're here and able to do your presentation. So I will hand over to you now, Sarah, thank you. Farrier decision making process, there's some really basic things we look at. Um, the type and the workload, and by that we look at the type of horse that we're doing um, and the workload that horse is going to be doing. And hand in hand with that are lots of different factors that help us to decide what we're going to do, how we're going to shoe it, if we're going to shoe it at all. Um, and two of the other big important factors are environment and also expectations. And the expectations can be related to the breed or the type of work as well. So I have a, a bit of a saying that confirmation determines the type. So if we have a fell pony, it's unlikely it's going to be the next Bolegro, but it's going to determine the type of horse it is. The type of horse is likely to determine the work that it's going to do. And the work is going to determine the trimming and the shoeing style. So if a horse is doing a lot of work, that's going to determine how much foot we take off. Um, if it's barefoot, if we're going to try and maintain a barefoot cycle. And if we're going to shoe it, it helps us to determine how thick the shoes are, how long it's shod. And that goes hand in hand with the environment as well. Another important thing that we ask ourselves as farriers when we're looking at horses, which is why it's always important that we have a well-lit, clean area to have horses out, to look at them prior to shoeing, is to look at whether or not we're looking at confirmation or compensation. So by that, what we ask ourselves is if a horse, very few horses have perfectly straight confirmation. So when we have a horse that we shoe on a regular basis and it appears to be moving differently or its shoe wears appears to change very drastically, then we have to ask ourselves, therefore, is it compensation? And these are two really important things because shoeing for confirmation, when we do this, we sometimes add extensions and um, graduations. We change the weight of the shoes. We choose the length of the shoes. And that's because we want to try and prolong that horse's working life. If it's a compensation, then it's very important that we work closely with owners, other paraprofessionals, and we work out what the compensation is being caused by. The idea behind that is then we can show them to try and make sure that we're showing them for the right reason. And it's not a confirmation fault, but in fact, it's compensating. So a best example of that is a, an event and pony I shod for a long time that started brushing all of a sudden and started to stand under very badly behind and actually had proximal suspensory dysmitis. But it was being able to realise that it was a change in posture. It was compensating as opposed to actually being its confirmation. And I've got an example here for you. This is a horse Apollo. Similar thing. If you look at its hind limbs, it stood under quite badly. This isn't confirmation. This was a horse that was aging. Its suspensories were starting to collapse. So that allowed me to best shoe it to try and help. And you can see in the next picture what a difference to its, its posture. It stood it back up. And this is the shoe we used. We used a hind egg bar shoe. A lot of the time in shoeing, we can use shoes to extend, change the length, to try and change the mechanics and how those feet operate and those limbs operate. And it's a really good example of just how easily we can do that. The horse is compensating its posture because of its aging process with suspensories, and we can very easily try and prop it back up and put it in a good position. So good basics are tailored to the environment. There are some very important basic fundamentals in horseshoeing. Flat level footfall when we trim horses' feet, whether it's for barefoot, whether it's for shoeing. It's really important that the most important thing we can achieve is to get them to land flat and level. If a horse lands flat and level, then every time its foot impacts the ground, the ground reaction forces are going to be level throughout those feet and the joints above them. So that's what we're always trying to achieve. What does change sometimes is the length of shoe that we can put on or a shoe at all. And 
the only thing I can marry this up to is where I live. I live in Yorkshire. And what it affects it in Yorkshire mainly is mud. And I'm sure I'm not the only place in the country that suffers from this. So quite often in the winter, I actually have a lot of clients who will take their horse's shoes off. When they're stood in this kind of slot for eight, 12 hours a day, it's really, really hard to try and keep shoes on, especially if you have horses that need to be shod with a lot of length and a lot of support. So these horses will have some downtime, which in general, I think is actually really important. These horses work really hard, nine, 10 months of the year. If you have the option to give their feet a rest, take the shoes off, let those walls recover before they have a hard season again, that's definitely an option that I'm in favour of. When it comes to trimming, more decision making, what shortens horses' feet? And that's a really important question. When we're shoeing, there's a lot of different clip choices. So there's a, a very big popularity with using quarter clips or toe clips or no clips. And what sometimes becomes really important, especially horses with lameness issues, is shortening their feet. A lot of lameness issues seem to be related to the length of feet, which then affects the tendons, affects posture and affects movement. In my mind, and I feel quite strongly about this, there are only two things in the world that actually shorten horses' feet. One of which is trimming, and the other is they either wear them out or they wear them down. Actual clip position and the type of clips and how many clips, that's actually very irrelevant. What is really important is trimming them to the right position to either have no shoe on or then to have the application of a shoe. So this is a little bit I took from the Wild Hearts Hoof Care page. Um, and this is talking a little bit about when we're trying to decide on a shoe and style. So when we're trying to decide if they need any additions to just a flat shoe or a shoe at all. Now, the Mustang Roll, a lot of you will probably have a, an understanding of that. Um, it's a bevel put around the bottom of the foot. Every time that foot breaks over, that wall is forced to fully load as it breaks over on it. And this is their definition of what they are trying to achieve. It allows us to shorten horses break over without shortening vertical depth between P3. Now, as farriers, I think sometimes we're maybe not so good at explaining this, but we are always trying to shorten horses break over without shortening vertical depth of P3. And by that, I mean, the more protective layers we can leave before, beneath the pedal bone, the, the stronger and the more integrity we're going to leave in that foot. So these are all things we think about as farriers when we're trying to decide on how short to take feet, what length they should be. We work in conjunction with a lot of veterinary surgeons using radiographs. But this is a basic principle, and it's interesting that this is on the Barefoot website, which tells us that actually two professions are trying to achieve the same thing, which is fantastic. It means we're all coming from the same hymn sheet. Soul callus where the arrow points. This is what we call the soul callus. Now, traditionally, when I was learning to shoe, we fit shoes up and we took our knife and we took that plane out. And we didn't want pressure. Actually, and I've learned a lot of this from the barefoot, we actually want that there. That soul callus actually weight bears. And it's a very important part of making sure that the whole bottom of the hoof capsule is weight bearing. So even with a shoe on, I'll leave that callus in. If they're barefoot, I'll leave that callus in. It's really important that the whole bottom of the foot is forced, forced to weight bear. When we put shoes on, we, we don't have the, the ability there to have that Mustang roll. So is there other things we can do? And there is. We can do things like set toes, which is where we roll the toe of the shoe up to make sure we get that contact. Um, roll toes in front, we call them set toes and hind feet. And sometimes we call them rocker toes as well. So we have lots of different variations when we do shoe horses to try and achieve that same trimming principle. The objective is it is load sharing. We want to make sure that we load as much of that wall as possible at all times. When the wall grows from the germative layers of the coronary band, it requires compression to keratinize and then effectively be that lovely hard structure we want the horse to be stood on. So it's really important that we make sure whatever shoe we use, if they're not barefoot, also allows that to take place to make sure that they load share and that the full wall is weight bearing at all times, if possible. Hind feet, are they any different? I don't think they really are. I think it's very important that hind feet are also forced, the wall is forced to weight bear all the way around. This is some examples of shoes and how we try and achieve that same role. So formerly known as SAFED, we used to call it safe in the toe of the shoe off. And you can see there on the right hand picture how that edge is chamfered. That's given that role and that easing the break over at the same time. 
Some of you might have heard of different brands of shoe. There's an equilibrium shoe. There's an easy breakover shoe. And sometimes we now call it multi-diagonal. And these are all trying to achieve the same thing. Ensure that the whole wall is weight bearing whilst helping to ease breakover. Do pathologies negate the need for variations of full wall loading? Actually, in a lot of pathologies, it becomes even more important when we're trying to show for different pathologies and diseases of the foot, it becomes really important that we keep that wall as healthy as possible. So if it's not barefoot and it has to be shod, it's really important. I think possibly they actually need it more. So from a farrier's point of view of getting the best from a set of shoes, what is really important? A regular shoeing cycle. Um, I have a lot of horses that refit and they actually refit time and time again. And part of that is because they're shod on a regular cycle. So short enough for the amount of work that they're doing. We can refit them. We can get loads of use out of those shoes. That's cheaper for the clients. Picking feet out, you know, picking feet out. How does that how does that increase your shoeing cycle? How does that get the most from them? When you're picking feet out, it gives you a really good opportunity to check that the shoes are where they should be. There's no sprung heels. If you have a horse springs a heel in its shoe and you don't notice it, the chances are it will be off, pulled off before you do notice it. So picking feet out and noticing these little things, has the shoe moved? Has it been half stood on? Things like that will definitely help you get the farrier out before there's a big problem and make sure we can put it right. Good dry turnout. I don't have an option of a lot of that around Yorkshire in the winter, but having good turnout or turning them out in short periods of time, turning them out in an area where they're not going to gallop around all of the time is going to help you make sure all four shoes or two shoes stay on for the whole period of that shoeing cycle. And in summer, the one of the most important things is sometimes a lot of my horses will claw back to seven weeks from eight or five weeks from six. Over the space of a year, I think it's actually only one extra set of shoes for pulling your horse a week earlier. I've got a couple of examples here of why this is really important. These two are in the middle of summer. The one at the top I hadn't shod before, but this was presented, but it presents the same problems. We've got risen clenches, we've got clips popped out the walls, we've got quarters, the foot spilling over the top of the shoe. These are the type of feet it's really important. If they're getting shod on a five week cycle, they really need to be shod on a four or a six week on a five, because what we want to do is we want to get to these feet before they get to this stage. So it's worth by the time these nails, these clenches pop up, then the nails are actually loose in the foot. And every day you're riding with nails that are loose in the foot, they're rattling about and they're bursting those walls up. So to get the most out of a set of shoes, actually, it's false economy to push them as long as you can. In fact, it's much better to get them done slightly earlier in the summer months to leave the feet in better condition. And you should be able to push them longer in the winter months. This is an example of a, a style of shoeing that I use quite a lot in the winter. And this is just to explain a little bit about, about fit and what decision making is. So I have a lot of horses hunt. And this is what I call a hunter style heel fit. So it shouldn't be short. It shouldn't be tight. It should be a mirror image of the foot that's underneath it. So the picture on the left, that's a hunter fit just on. And the picture on the right is that same heel fit five weeks later. It just grows out with the foot. So this is the type of horse that's doing fast work, deep ground, muddy fields, but it has to be shod between four and five weeks. So there is always compensation for trying to do something, maybe not in the textbook where we should do with as much length. In terms of remedial shoeing, this is just a quick slide to give you an idea of different types. Now, remedial shoeing is shoeing for specific faults and conditions and pathologies. Do they all need shod if they have a fault or a condition? Absolutely not. Do they all need shod in steel shoes? As Mark just previously said, absolutely not. What we do when we use different types of shoes is all about mechanics. So we use different lengths, like that egg bar I showed you on that horse to change posture, to move the weight, weight distribution and mechanic distribution. It's very clever that we can put a, a longer shoe on and it will unload some of the tendons and load other ones. So if we have a deep digital flexor tendon injury and we raise the heels, it will unload that tendon allowing it to heal. If we have a superficial or a suspensory, we can shoe it longer and that will load the deep, but take the 
the pressure from the superficial or the suspensory. So the egg bar in the middle is an example of a uh, shoe that we would use for a lot of length. The heart bar on the right hand side, I'm sure a lot of you have seen before, that's used historically, it was popularised actually in the 1960s um, for laminitis, but actually I use this a lot in thoroughbreds when the walls are really weak. I transmit some of that weight through the frog instead of just through the wall. It's a very versatile shoe. Some people now use it for pedal bone fractures, but it's just another way of changing weight and moving it. We can use it for hoof cracks. If we have hoof cracks that are bleeding, we can transmit more weight through the frog and the back half of the foot away from the area that's affected. And the picture on the, the, the left hand side is an example of a bar shoe. But actually, if you look at it, you'll see that it has the heels raised on it. So this is the type of shoe we may use, for example, a deep digital flexor tendon injury. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an insight into how we make decisions as farriers and how we get to that point. And I say thank you very much for that, Sarah. I really appreciate that. And I'm glad that we got there with the technology in the end, um, which was great. I'd also like to thank Mark at this point. So I now have a number of questions that have come through. So if you just bear with me, if you're both happy, I will just start to ask them. So I don't know if you want to take it in order as to who is going to um answer first i'm more than happy to go so if, if we have um mark and sarah on screen which is brilliant and sarah do you just want to stop sharing your screen sorry then we can have you all large just on the there we go perfect even better that's it we've got sarah and mark that that's brilliant so i'm i'm happy if you want to decide who wants to answer first and then who wants to fill in because some of the questions we're having a quick skim through may be more relevant to one or the other, but it's always interesting that difference of viewpoint. So first question. Well, I'll give it to ladies first, and then if Sarah doesn't want it, then <laughs> see what I can do with it. How's that? Very good. <laughs> this, this, well, yeah, this will apply to both of you. I'm a vet physio and my own horses are barefoot and wear boots. How can we work together to educate owners hoof balance is still important in barefoot? I think um, I think just general foot balance is important, I say, regardless of shoeing or barefoot. And I think it, it is educating, it's educating at grassroots. It's getting into your pony club level, getting into your lower level eventing, putting clinics on, putting um, evenings on for clients. And I think it's important to put them on in conjunction with paraprofessionals such as vets and physios and barefoot trimmers because we are all coming from the same place. And as I said in my lecture, level flat footfall is an absolute ultimate, regardless of confirmation. So if we're all pushing the same thing um, and getting together and doing that, that's, that's what will change it. I, if I can come in with this, I mean, I, I think that it's absolutely crucial to uh, team build for these scenarios as well, because uh, I don't know about you, Sarah, but but certainly I find that with these complex horses, we cannot operate without a team. So we can't operate without a body worker. We can't operate without a vet. And it, bringing all these elements together, that's your that's your package. And the more we can do to, as you say, Sarah, you know, get get that kind of education out there. Absolutely, that's way forward. Brilliant. Thank you. Do you have any advice on which boots would suit larger sized feet with heavy feathers? We are front oh. short and I would <laughs> like to move to bare foot. Mark, all yours. <laughs> do you like it? Yeah, I, do you know, this is the biggest bugbear that we've got going. I mean, the Cavallo Bigfoot is probably as far as I'm aware, unless the old Max, the G2s and et cetera, they go up pretty damn big. But guys fall out of love with your feathers. Just just don't have them. <laughs> you know, no, realistically, if you're trying to get a boot on and you've got a whole heap of feather there, you're going to struggle. But 
there are bigger boots, but lean on on the boot suppliers for your specific course because it is challenging for sure. And and all of us in the game, we're always on at these boot manufacturers. Please, can we have a bigger boot? And they always come back with, well, it's you know that would be very much a lost leader because it costs so much money to get these um, these molds made up, etc. But oh, if only you know for the big ones. Brilliant, thank you. Do you have anything you want to add on that, Sarah? Are you happy with Mark's answer? No, I think Mark is definitely the boot specialist from the two of us. It's uh, his area of expertise. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I have a track system livery yard near me, which I'd love to move my horse to. However, a condition to having a place there is that I must use their barefoot trimmer. I am happy to have my horse barefoot, but would really want to keep my own farrier to do the trim. Is there a reason that they won't allow a farrier trim? And what is the difference? Um, I think that probably comes down to personal relationships on the yard. Um, I do a lot mm. of big studs and I certainly have no problem with anybody else coming on. So whether that's a farrier issue or an owner of the yard issue where they like to keep it simple with one person, sometimes it's just that if they deal with one professional on the same day. But I think realistically, if you explain your concerns, um, you are responsible for your horse's feet and I think that you should be able to use whoever you like. Yeah. I'd agree. I'd absolutely agree with that. Um, just to just to go a little bit further with the difference between a farrier or a barefoot trim, that's down to the person doing the trim. There may be no difference, or there may be a world of difference. Um, if we get heavy-handed with our frog trimming, sole trimming, and bar trimming, because we believe in aesthetics, or we believe in actually the, the process of making sure that foot is, is is clinically clean, then potentially we've disabled it in terms of barefoot performance. So, ah, goodness, it's, it's, it's impossible really to say that the difference, but it's certainly not, the barefoot trim is certainly not the application of a steel shoe trim. The two things, you know, have to be by design different. Do you, do you agree with that, Sarah, or...? I do, and I'm a big believer that <clears throat> I probably changed that. I think farriers by nature are extremists and uh, we like symmetry and we like things to look very clinical. But actually, the longer I've shod, the less I do. I now pick up feet and say, what is the what is the least I can do to this to leave integrity? But I'm quite sure that barefoot Excellent. trimmers possibly go through the same. You know, we, we evolve and we grow and our skill set grows. So. Yeah. Farrier, barefoot trimmer, it, 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 it's kind of irrelevant. It's shoeing and trimming the horse for the environment it's in, which is what I said before. You know, if it's some of these track systems I've seen, we've got one that actually failed around here because they used the wrong, they had like hardcore down, you know. So it wouldn't matter who trimmed it. It would be the wrong environment. But you have to look at that tracking mm. system and trim those horses in accordance, farrier or barefoot trimmer. So I think what you are is irrelevant. Doing the right job for that particular horse in that environment is much more important. Brilliant. It would be nice though. It would be nice if there was a way, a way through this because again, it's you know it's down to information share. What would that farrier be bringing to that track system environment where the livery owner wants to go to? We don't know what information and skill sets he could be, or he or she could be really enhancing that with with another level of skill set. You know, we've got to break barriers down somewhere, haven't we? I think that's what this webinar series is doing brilliantly, I'd have to say. The, the next question, I think this is going to be you, Mark. I think you can sit this one out, Sarah. What are the best hoop boots on the market? The ones that work. <laughs> is that a real cop out? Ah, oh, crumbs. Honestly, it is the ones that work for the individual horse. And it it's it's going to depend on on multiple factors it's going to depend on what you want to do with your horse why does it need boots in the first place what issues is it actually battling with let's take a let's all right let's boot that very very thin sole very compromised um horse that's very very delicate let's boot that one so typically if i was going to use say a scoop boot I would be definitely wanting to fit so that I could get a, a, a 12 millimeter pad underneath that foot to give it 
give it some protection and some some comfort. The equine fusion shoes have got fantastic soles on them, a standalone. They're very, very supportive. They're really thick and protective. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's it, and you've got to you've also got to mitigate for rubbing as well, because let's let's not avoid the issue. Boots have the potential for rubbing. So we really need to get that boot that's going to fit that horse in the very, very best way. And this is where it's so much fun to do the adaptations on hoof boots. What can we do to mitigate rubbing? How can we help that work? So there isn't a boot that I would say my, my typical go to's would be scoot flex fusion and the easy care gloves but there is a plethora of boots out there as well and that's again why if i go back to my presentation that's why i refer to helping the owner to get sizes if i'm not sure and let's go and ask a real expert in the field so that's really how i would i would approach that but the innovation and the general quality of boots now fantastic Did you, have any... Did you enjoy your coffee, Sarah? <laughs> God, stressful technical issues earlier, yes. <clears throat> there, bless that's you. Like, bless you. Do, do you have anything you would like to add into that, Sarah? I don't, I don't but it's interesting because I've learned a lot tonight listening to Mark because I have clients say to me, I don't want to reassure them. I love being barefoot and I don't have a vast knowledge about the boots, you know. So it's been really interesting learning from Mark tonight, these popular, what he would recommend um as, as the boots going forward well my, myself and robbie richardson have a huge passion to try and address that within farriery because we farriers like i said earlier we're genetically designed to mess around with hoof boots and develop bits and pieces to stick them on or, or all the rest of it there's so much that we could do within the farriery envelope with boots if we only i don't know what it takes a bit of a bit of a mind shift bit of interest but Eventually, we, we want to get a course together to try and help farriers to, to achieve some of this stuff. I think the really interesting thing with Boots is when you're members of certain social media groups, actually, it's really interesting within that group of an interest, if it was thoroughbreds, how they will ask each other what works best for their type of horse. And it's always yeah. really yep. interesting, the information that comes up are horses with deep chests, that they have rug fitting problems, that actually there's a huge yeah. amount of knowledge out there for what actually works for that type. So it's really interesting. The, the next question is a sort of two in one, and it's one that I'd noted down from a farrier's perspective. So I'm going to read them out and I think sort of they all fall into the nutritional side what are the most important aspects of diet low sugar and starch and the next one is what are the best feed supplements to help improve growth and quality my question would be would be as a farrier how often do you recommend a nutritional change be it through supplements or diet or grass or instead of haylage or from that nutrition side how often would you advise i probably get asked that a lot more in the summer months when the feet are weaker <clears throat> through the winter when they jug along and they're not too bad people don't seem so bothered but in the summer quite often you actually offer that information because we'll go to feet that are maybe on poor grass and um, they've gone from being hunting in the winter lots of food feet look okay and they go out onto some really rough grass and um, they're not getting feed all of a sudden and not getting hay. I recommend probably yeah, at least once a week people will ask me about hoof supplements to improve and the problem I've got is the market is absolutely flooded with lotions, potions, everybody has an opinion on what works um, and it probably goes back to a really simple thing of generally you pay for what you get. So in terms of a supplement I always recommend um, NAF Profi, I've had some really good results with the liquid form and, and Farrier's formula. And what I always say is it's very expensive, but it also has done a lot of scientific lab work to prove that it's got the right amount of all those different vitamins and minerals that you need to help. And it does only help because it, it's from the inside out, isn't it? You know, a lot of these horses with poor feet are genetically predisposed to that. And that it is only so much. There's not a a magic hoof oil we're going to put on or a magic feed that's going to transform them but we can certainly help to complement them and complement good growth where we can down down in my neck of the woods we're absolutely surrounded by ryegrass now here's a little challenge for you do, do, maybe do it in the summer when the grass is coming through cut some grass off that's that's growing through in your field and really scrunch it up 
imagine the horse has chewed it and swallowed it because as it goes through that digestive tract you've got lots of little envelopes at the in other words that they shape the poo that comes out the other end but if you really squeeze it together and and pound it together like a horse would do take a and but by the time the the, the green slime's running out of it take a deep inhalation of that and you'll find out that it actually burns the back of your throat you know because it is actually so very acidic so We've got to think about the way the horse processes it. If we're going to give them lots of lush ryegrass in, in that environment, we will turn their bodies acidic. We will prevent the bacteria fermentation process going on. So the consistency of the feed is really, really important. And I am not a nutritionist, but if you do the same thing with, with hay, scrunch it up, it'll spring apart. At least we can get the bacteria in between it. And that was the whole reason really why I shared that slide about my nutritional go-tos. Um, for sure, sugar and starch low. I've, I found myself, and that's mainly thanks, I suppose, to Forage Plus, to be fair, um, in the in later months or, or recent months slash year or so, uh, the recommendation of upping protein levels for some of these horses which are struggling has had a massive beneficial effect on feet. So once we get those amino acids in the right kind of places, it really does start to make a difference. But I will always, always, I'm going to end up referring to a trusted source for my final, you know, recommendations. Brilliant, thank you. This again is sort of a, is a two part question. It's sort of two questions that I'm going to amalgamate into one. What is the best way to treat hoof wall separation and prevent it in future? Can it be triggered by cold weather? And would you still recommend the use of composite for a horse suffering from hoof wall separation disease? Sorry, what was the second part of that question, Eric? Would you still recommend the use of composite for a horse suffering from a horse hoof wall separation disease? I think like most um, most problems with feet, it's really important that you work out why it's happening. So is it nutritional? Right. Is it growth? Um, you know, is the growth not coming from the top layers? Often you see these feet, they're straw-like, the walls peeled away and we've got this straw-like structure. Has it separated because it's had laminitis and it's had um, abscess and necrotic tissue there? Has it separated because it's just the condition of the wall for that time of year or there's too much toe on it? So slotting it down to exactly what the cause is, is going to help us treat it. So the question with synthetics goes back to that. Synthetics for me, especially, for instance, I use a lot of imprint granules. They simulate a similar pattern of loading as the hoof wall. So I use them to fill lots of spaces sometimes to try and help compress, and I'll stop that keratinization. Use them to fill it so that the wall is weight bearing, the bit that's missing you're essentially replacing. So yeah, I think synthetics definitely have their place, but more importantly is working out the cause of that separation. You agree, Mark? Absolutely, yeah, 100%. You've got to get to the causality. Um, I mean, the typical sort of things that were going through my brain cell then were, um, have, we, have, we got, have we got enough zinc? Have we got enough copper going in there? Are the amino acids at a right level? I know, I know there is debate within the nutritional world about it, but I, I think that there's a lot to be said for your hay and pasture analysis and soil analysis as well to really find out at least what that horse is consuming. Um, I don't mean to step on nutritionist toes with this, but it, I would certainly be having that conversation based on anecdotal evidence in the past uh, where clients have gone down that route of getting their nutrition analysed. Because, you know, you can pull the topicals on these things till you're blue in the face. But as Sarah said, if you don't get to that causality, that's very, very important. And also comfort for the horse during this period, because you've got a compromised hoof capsule, there's every possibility they're going to be suffering low grade inflammation. So obviously in my world, I'd be looking to try and boot. I wouldn't want to nail through that stuff at the minute personally, just because we've got a hoof that isn't integral. So comfort is a massive thing. If we can get that horse comfortable, its cortisol levels, its stress hormone is going to drop. When that happens, we'll have less glucose flowing around the body. Body, the whole body will will relax more so, and that is another element to to combating it so definitely nutrition definitely trying to or, or will nutrition out make sure it's not the problem but but yeah definitely got to get to that cause rather than the treating the symptom i think that that leads on quite nicely to the next question 
What sort of time frame would you expect to see some difference in the hoof from a change in nutrition? Uh, in almost, to be fair, almost instant. It's because this is happening on a cellular level. OK, so, yes, we don't witness that cellular change because nutrition is being carried through the blood flow. So the minute it starts hitting the blood flow, the horse is picking up on it. And if you get it right, you don't have to wait months and months to see that difference. It's literally I've seen horses feet change and horses demeanor change within a fortnight. It can be that fast if you hit on the appropriate thing that that horse is missing or taking away the thing it's had too much of. So it can be very, very quick. Do you have anything you'd like to add at that point? You know? also very quickly go the other way. It's interesting what Mark was saying about understanding. I think it's important to understand your grazing, understanding your land. I had a very interesting case with a horse that had horizontal cracks that were nearly fully around the hoof capsule and that was from selenium toxicity too much selenium in the ground yeah. that you wouldn't think to test there for it mm. unless you have this problem mm. and that's where social media can be really bad but loads of people had put <laughs> from around the world had put little cases on the done so when i came across it i thought oh, i've seen this before and went back and researched it um but things like that understanding your land and, and what it's in and i'm sure mark's been the same i've shot horses at different parts of this county and the feet have gone from being really good to literally falling apart because the soil's different yep. the acidity is different um, so it's amazing what yep. a difference that does make to the makeup of that hoof capsule i think as absolutely. well absolutely it's really interesting, isn't it? Because we always sort of say we're selenium deficient. So absolutely it is that individual merit from where you are yeah. geographically and how your horse utilises it. Thank you. And if you don't test, how will you know? Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. As, as I keep saying, a blood test is very often cheaper than a lot of the additives that you feed to your horse. <laughs> See whether it actually requires it. Ne next question. My pony dishes plats has side bone in both his front feet. Is it possible for him to go barefoot? He wears his shoes down in six weeks when in full work. Um, Shall I start that one? If you want, yeah. I, I would say it is possible, but you're going to have to work with boots as well. Um, you, you've got to be prepared to support these animals. Um, and and also, is it possible? So much of this is environmentally led. You know, that's why horseshoeing is still around, because for a lot of our domestic horses, we haven't got the ideal optimum environments and we're just trying to help them compensate. But if you're prepared to work hard, and I think you, I, I'm quite sure you could do it with hoof boots and it would probably be a little bit more forgiving on the movement as well on that basis. Sarah, yours. Um, I think, like I said in that, when I was talking about trimming, the most important thing, and your, your pony sounds like it has a lot of issues going on, is trying to get it to land flat and level. So regardless of whether it's barefoot, whether we use a shoe, and, and the reason sometimes that we do use shoes is to try and extend that working life which is what you're looking to do so is there a way to do that with shoes absolutely we try and mimic the wear pattern of the foot i think it would come down to how much work you're doing if you're wearing steel shoes out in six weeks maybe you need to alter your work pattern if you'd like to go barefoot in collaboration with boots i don't know how mark feels about that it's like i said in the slide before the only way to shorten feet is to wear them out or trim them and it might just be a possibility that you could be wearing them out in that cycle if you don't have a shoe on there, which, like Mark says, you would need a boot. Now, I don't, I don't know whether I'm still online, am I? I can certainly hear you. Yes, you are. You are still online. Ah, oh, brilliant! Because I've, I've lost all visual from you. So, uh, as long as the audio and the and the camera's still working, yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, cut, cut, be prepared to cut the horse some slack. Um, and you do have to make modifications. But if if people are passionate enough to to want to achieve it, there's no reason why not. So brilliant. Thank you. Um, quite a specific one. My thoroughbred has abscess after abscess. She has very thin soles around two mil. And I've tried taking her barefoot, but she is so too sore. 
I've tried various boots. I feel there's a question mark. I don't know whether it's a crystal ball moment for you as if you've got any solutions or thoughts that you can offer. There's something systemic going on, definitely. Um, there's, there's possibly immune stuff going on. I would be, I'd be chucking the whole nine yards at this and finding out. Uh, you say it was a mare, Eric, did you? It says my thoroughbred. It doesn't say whether it's a mare, a gelding or a star. Oh, OK, right. Uh, well, if, if it's not putting down decent amount of soul, if it's, if it, you know, and it's struggling along those those lines, I'd have alarm bells ringing in terms of what's the gastric performance like, you know, has it got ulcers? Typically, that kind of a horse will throw up having ulcers because the systemic abscessing is anything but normal. So you've got something driving that, which needs probably deeper investigation. Um, ulcers definitely would, would be on the radar for me because, it again, it being symptomatic of something not being right. If, if in the digestion you have had a big history of ulcers, Within the digestive tract, you've got things called gastric glands. Now, if you've got a lot of scarring going on over those gastric glands from historical ulceration, etc., then that horse is not going to be uptaking nutrition in the way that it should be. So that's kind of how my brain cell is going to be working. But, um, hey, you know, it, I wouldn't force a horse that's, that's blatantly struggling. I think you've got to prioritise maintaining comfort however you're going to do it and work hard on getting the whole horse health sorted out as best you can Sarah would you like to add anything to that no I think all Mark's points are, are relevant you know it's trying to work it out and then trying to get again most of these things it's about working out the cause you know if you strip it back and work out the cause we can do lots of different things to feed and we can think we've got somewhere with them, whether it's nutrition change, environment change, shoeing change, trimming change, and then they can go back over really quickly. So the cause is the ultimate to try and make sure it's not a reoccurring problem. Um, and you really need to pinpoint where this is coming from. Thank you. We're, we're moving on to the final, the last couple of questions. My homebred Highland Pony is 22 years old now and has always been shod all round. Is it too late to try to convert him to barefoot? Absolutely not. With Sim? It's not. Yeah. Sorry, Sarah, go on. Beg your pardon. No, I was going to say absolutely not. It's never too late to try anything different. I think when, you, as from a farrier's point of view, that's that's taken a lot of horses from shod to barefoot at different times of the year and then back to shod, some not at all. I think the most important thing is timing, environment, turnout, um, doing it a bit at a time. So take your hinds off, give them eight to 12 weeks to adjust to that then possibly taking your front off. It doesn't all have to be done at once, so it's a shock to the system. So the most successful cases I've had of going on older horses from shod to barefoot, and I do a lot of thoroughbreds that have these really thin soles, weak feet, and it is definitely doable, but your timing and making sure that you do it in the right stages and you're conscious of the horse's reactions to that um, is definitely the most important way to get there. Absolutely. Um, laying as much of the foundations before you even take a shoe off, so so get your diet as, as healthy and good as possible and allow that to sit to sink in for a you know a good month before you actually make that move pick a time when you when you haven't got too much stress on the horse so you're not got any demands on it in other words um and yeah be be prepared obviously to come in with hoof boots and and just just give that extra support or you might just find that by taking the shoes off it'll fly and it'll be very very happy you've always got to listen to the horse and take their opinion but yeah Absolutely. Go Thank for it. You. So the, the can I just can I sorry Eric? Not at all. I was, just, I was just going to add there as well. When people talk about taking shoes off, um, I always recommend any time between October and February. That's your your ground is the softest at that time of year, and it's going to be the most forgiving. So picking your time of year to do it is really important as well. Think about what it's going to be stood on. Think about what it's going to be doing as well, and that will probably get you a better result much quicker than taking them off in June. Superb, thank you for that bit of practical advice. That All these little bits soon add up and help, don't they? Our final question, and you sort of touched on it earlier, Mark. Um, how do you stop boots rubbing? Fit is important, but with so many edges and straps combined with movement, boots look as though they will rub the skin. So I would then sort of question you at my own interest as well. 
would you be the one that then fitted the boots or would you leave that up to the owner of the horse to do that? Um, I think with the more, certainly with the more complex ones where there is a consideration for rubbing, that's where it's helpful to have somebody with some experience to, to help you. Um, for example, let's, let's go through a few scenarios. Uh, the Cavallo hoof sock is really, really useful because obviously you can, and, and you've got to size your boot accordingly. So if you're going to put some kind of protection over the skin, then we need to think about the, the sizing of the boot and maybe padding the boot itself. Um, Filter back is also really, really useful. Sorry, can you still hear me? My screen's yeah. doing weird things yeah, here. Yeah, I can still hear yeah. yeah, uh, there's, there's, there's a product called filter back, which I got introduced to not that long ago. And it's, it's actually a sunblock, but it forms an, an antibacterial second skin. So that is really, really useful. You can get very small um, thicknesses of like near neoprene which have got a sticky back to them as well so that's also possible to mess around with um we can a lot of these hoof boots although it will void your warranty unfortunately uh you can physically stretch them as well uh, by using heat so yeah it's if you've got one that's going to be a bit tricky then then somebody with some experience but again i'm going to come back to the likes of urbanhorse.com and the hoof boutique They've got such a depth of experience in this. Uh, if you haven't got a professional on hand that's that's that way inclined. Sarah, would you like to add anything to that? No, just backing up what Mark was saying. Getting that, I think, there, you know, there's loads of professionals out there who are so passionate about their bit of the business um, and they're more than happy to offer advice. So take the time to go and speak to them. Brilliant. Th thank you very much. So that, that rounds up the questions for this evening as we come sort of to close up this um, evening's webinar. I would like to say a huge thank you to Sarah Brown and Mark Johnson for sticking with us, for um, negotiating the slightly bumpy road we had <laughs> earlier this evening to get here. You've been a couple of superstars, so that's brilliant. I'd like to apologise at this point for starting late. It was just a little bit out of our hands. The gremlins took over, I'm afraid, and sort of made us a little bit late. But we got here and we delivered, which was brilliant, two really, really good presentations. So thank you both very much for giving up your time and sharing just what is a very small snapshot of your expertise. It's much appreciated. So next. Thank week, you very much. Not at all. It's been an absolute pleasure. Next week at the same time in the same place, we'll be looking at the third and final in our webinar series, which will be titled Surfaces and Competing. There are still some spaces available to get, so get your place booked. Um, we had a full house tonight with another just short of 500 waiting for the video only feature. Next week, our presenters will be Axel Vibe and Ben Benson. This third session, is about sport and modern surfaces from sand to synthetic, fibre, rubber, recycled surfaces, indoor and outdoor, and how they all influence the hoof. Competing and rules surrounding shoeing and the different circumstances will all be discussed as well as safety, slippage and speed. Also the role of the judge giving a bit of an insight um, as to what they think and the rules they go by. This has given the right impression and ultimately back to where we started three weeks ago, which is equine welfare and the miracle that is the equine hoof. I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening for the second of our webinars. Um, and I, again, I would like to thank the British Horse Society for actually putting on this webinar, which is supported by the British Farrier and Blacksmiths Association. So I look forward to your company next week for the final session. And I'd like to say thank you very much and good night to you all. See you next week. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mark. Bye.